सहनावतो सहनोभुनक्त सह वीर्यंकरवाहस्वीनावधीतमस्तुम विद्विषावह ओ शाशाशा ओ पूर्णमदूर्णमद पूर्णमुदच्यते पूर्ण से पूर्णमादा पूर्णमे वशिष्य ओ शाति 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 श्रुतिस्मृतिपुरा आलय करुणाल भगवत्द शंकर लोकशंक शंकर शंकराचार्य केशव बादरायण सूत्रभाष्यकृत वंदे भगवतन पुनः स्वरो गुरुरात्म मूर्ति भेद विभागिने व्योमद्याप्तहाय दक्षिणामूर्त नम गुकारस्वकारस्तकारस्तवर्तक अंधकार निरोधि गुरुरीयते सदा शिव सरंभा शंकराचार्य मध्यमा अस्मदाचार्य पर्यता वंदे गुरुपरम ड्यूरिंग दिस वीक यू आर प्लैंग टू डू दर्टीन चैप्टर भगवदगीता रेली फ्रॉम द वर्सेस ट्वेल्व टू थर्टी फोर supposedly you've done the first 11 verses in the earlier camp but what i propose to do is to discuss the earlier verses anyway uh, so that there is a background of what we went through and then continue with the 12th verse and also it is very relevant in reference towards swami ji talked about in the morning and we'll continue to talk about also <coughs> so open your camp booklet and uh, Let us read the verses one by one. Let us read the first verse, not unnumbered verse actually. Arjuna uvaache, prakritim purusham chayva, kshetram kshetragnya mevache. सो इन सम एडिशन दिस वर्स इज इंक्लूडेड एज ए फर्स्ट वर्स ऑफ दर्टीन चैप्टर इन मेनी स्टैंडर्ड एडिशन इट इज नॉट इंक्लूडेड सो अकॉर्डिंग टू दिस दर्टीन चैप्टर भगवदगीता opens with this question on the part of arjuna arjuna asks this question etat vejitam ichhami o lord i wish to know this what is it prakrutim purusham chaiva what is prakruti and what is purusha prakruti and purusha this will be all described subsequently purusha as we know is the conscious self the self is called purusha purishayanat purusha the one who dwells in the city of the body is called purusha so in the in the scriptures upanishads our body or our body mind complex rather is compared to a puri is compared to a city because it has various characteristics of a city in the olden days a city would have a a fort around itself and then there will be o oh, gates from which you can enter or you can leave so in this city also the body outer body is like the fort and there are gates our sense organs of perception are the gates there are five organs of perception which are comparable to five apertures so five gates 
So faculty of hearing, faculty of seeing, faculty of taste, faculty of touch, faculty of smell, these five are called organs of perception and it is these are the gates with which we communicate or interact with the world and thus we gain the perception of different objects in the world. So world also consists of fivefold objects. Shabda, Sparsha, Rupa, Rasa, Gandha. So this is how it is conceived. The, the objects of the world also can be looked upon as made up of these five categories. The sound, the taste, the touch, the form, the smell. So these are the five objects of the world which are perceived by the five corresponding object or organs of perception. And so that is how the stimuli from these sense objects enter our mind. If these gates were not there, if the ears were not there, for example, or if I could not hear, then the sound, the sound stimuli could not have entered my mind. And so this is how the sense objects enter me. They impact my mind through the gate of the sense organ of perception. Therefore, these organs of perception are compared to gates. Not that there are gates, but there are gates through which the sense objects can come out, come in. Also there are the gates through which the mind can go out. So the impact, the stimuli from the various sense objects comes to me through the sense organs of perception. And my mind also travels out into the objects of the world, wandering into different objects of the world, like it says some sound is coming, and mind says, wait a minute, what's coming there? And that's how the mind goes out of the faculty of hearing to that sound which, or noise which may be coming. Some movement takes place there, immediately the mind goes out through the eyes to look what is there. And so these are the gates also through which the mind goes out, you see. So going out and coming in, this kind of a transaction takes place for the whole day through, throughout the waking hours and therefore this organs of perception can be compared to the gates. And then there are gatekeepers. There are gatekeepers. What we call the presiding deities, you know. So there's a gatekeeper. The gatekeepers are those who control the functions. So there is a devata, a, a deity called the, the big devata, the quarters, which control the function of hearing. The sun, Surya Devata, the sun god, controls the function of seeing and thus associated with every organ of perception or everything that is taking place in our body, that is what we call a presiding deity, that can be compared to a gatekeeper. Then there is a minister, the mind is a minister who controls all of this. And there is a prime minister, the intellect is a prime minister. Then there is a king, our self is the king. Then there is a palace also, the heart is like the palace where the king lives. And this is how, and of course we, uh, if you go to the Yoga Shastra, then many other things will be stated. How there are many highways there, the Ida, Pingala, Sushumna, different highways are there, so forth and so on. So, these descriptions are found. The idea is that this body, mind complex, our personality, can be compared to a city. Which is a very beautiful analogy. Because where the city is, there must be also the king. Important thing is, where the city is, the king must be there, the presiding deity must be there, the king must be there. Sometimes the king is not there. Then when we go into a town, even there is no vivastha, there is no organization at all, there is a complete chaos, then we know that the presiding deity is not there. Like you go into somebody's house and when you find things just here and there, you perhaps infer that the lady of the house must have gone for vacation or something like that. And that's why there is no vivastha at all. In the, in the home in India also, servants are there, they just do whatever they want. But if there is a supervisor, then they perform their functions properly. In a town also, when everybody performs their functions properly, then we know that there will be someone who's, who controls them or whose presence must be there. So, similarly also in our body, everything is done very systematically, in a very orderly way. The organs of perception, the organs of action, Everything, all of them perform their functions very systematically. That shows that there must be someone because of whom these functions are performed systematically. Even if you do not see the king, it's not that we can see the king as we go to the town, it's not always available, not accessible. And still, for the very functioning of things that are going on in the town, we can infer that the king must be there. 
you know Swamiji is there in Gurukulam, you know, you know, you know he is not there also when you come. So the presiding deity, the presence is always known one way or the other, or absence is known. And similarly also in a town or a city, the presence of the king will be known. Here also in our city, everything is functioning systematically. That shows that there must be a presiding deity, there must be someone, and that is the self. That is called the king, Raja, Rajasthaniya hai. The self is in the place of the king. In is called Raja. King is called in Sanskrit Raja. Raja te one who shines. So one in whose presence everything takes place. The king doesn't have to do anything. If the king is really the king, then his presence itself is enough for things to take place. In his presence, his ministers and all the other officers, they just do what is to be done. He need not even instruct them. But they know exactly what the king wants. And knowing his want or desire, they do what is to be done. In short, the presence of a king alone is enough. The king does not have to do anything. His presence is enough. In his presence, everything takes place. Similarly also, Atma, the self, the consciousness, doesn't have to do anything. It is in presence of the self that everything takes place. This will be of course the subject matter of the discussion. But as in Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, it is in my presence that the prakriti, this matter of the maya, if that does everything, it creates, sustains, dissolves, everything is done in my presence, that I am just a presence. And so the self is of the nature of conscious presence, in the presence of whom everything <coughs> takes place. <coughs> so, and this is how, uh, also another thing is that the king remains unaffected by the changes taking place in the city. Sometimes the city expands, when he conquers some territory, sometimes it shrinks when the enemies conquer some territory. So this city also expands sometimes, it shrinks sometimes, various things happen. So just as the king remains unaffected, free from expansion and shrinking regardless of what happens to the city, that is, in and through all the changes or modifications the vikara is taking place, the king is nirvikara, he is changeless. And similarly also, in and through the changes taking place in the body and in the mind and in the sense organs and the personality constantly changes are taking place there is sometimes expansion sometimes contraction all various things happen but in spite of all of these one who remains unchanged the important thing is changes cannot take place without him but he himself remains free from change that's important nothing can happen without him but he does not do anything. So this is how the example of king is a very, very beautiful example to illustrate the nature of self or purusha. So purishayanat purushaha, one who dwells in the city of the body is called purushaha. And that refers to the self, refers to the consciousness. <coughs> also puranatvat purushaha, one who is purnaha, one who is complete and whole, he is also called purusha. That way also the self is purusha because he is complete, he is whole, he is infinite, he is limitless. <coughs> so understand that word purusha here does not mean man or prakriti doesn't mean woman. So purusha and prakriti. So Swamiji, how come that always this God is always used, you know, why do you call him he? And why for the self we always have these masculine words, you know? So sometimes uh, girls or women ask, you know, Sometimes embarrassing questions because I don't know, I haven't done it, you know. But anyway, <laughs> what happens is that being a Swami, you are a defender, you know. So you have to defend things. Why did Lord Krishna do this in, you know, in Mahabharata? You know? Why did Lord Rama do this? No, I can't join them and say, yeah, Krishna is like that. We cannot say that. <laughs> we always have to give reason and proper reason for why Lord Krishna did what he did. This is a common question. Moment you try to promote or project the Vedic culture, everything is all right. They, you know, 99% things may be okay, but 1% here and there, there is something. That's what counts. The whole, in whole Mahabharata, only questions are, why did Lord Krishna ask Arjuna to kill Kara? That's the only question. Or oh, why did Lord Krishna ask Vidhishthira to say this? See, is that all there is in Mahabharata? There's nothing else, but this is all. And if you cannot answer this question satisfactorily, then whole oh, Mahabharata is dismissed. <laughs> and about God also questions are asked, how come there is this suffering in the world and why is there injustice and why? 
But I say there is a lot of happiness also, there is a lot of harmony also. There is, why are people like this? They are all greedy and corrupt. But there is a lot of goodness also. There is a lot of righteousness also. That nobody bothers. Nobody writes about it. <laughs> and then, well, being a Swami, it becomes one of the responsibilities, you know, to defend things also. <coughs> of course, we find our defenses also, you know. Why did Lord Rama uh, abandon Sita? The standard in Ramayana one question always. <laughs> and many women have problem with Rama, around Rama because why did he abandon uh, Sita? So our answer is uh, Rama, Lord Rama did not not only abandon Sita, he abandoned himself also. How? I said read further. What kind of life did he live? If Sita was abandoned to forest, did he live in the palace? He never lived in the palace. He always lived outside the palace. He lived from then on the life of an ascetic. He never lived the luxury of the king. You think Sita alone is suffering in the forest? He is not suffering. She alone is suffering because of the separation. He also is suffering because of separation. He did not do this for the sake of his own pleasure. If some action was taken for the sake of one's own pleasure or some selfish motive, then we can question it. This was the motive of all the subjects, all the people of Ayodhya and that is why this was done and so on and so forth, you know, so what I'm, all of you have to define and understand, you know, when you now come to Guru Kulam and listen to all of this, then you, uh, you can ask us whatever questions you want. When you go out, then you become the representatives, you know. <laughs> so one of the Swamis, when I was, you know, a Brahmachari and then I went to seek his blessings, hey, you are a soldier of Shankaracharya, he says, you know. So that is what it is, soldiers of Shankaracharya, you know, and so soldiers of Swamiji, that's how it happens. <laughs> and so, yes, that is true, that uh, uh, the, whatever it is that you stand for has to be defended also. Of course, it must be defended in one's own mind to begin with, and then comes the question of defending before others. But, <clears throat> so this Purusha, the masculine words, you know, this, these questions are asked. <clears throat> So how come they are, we call God He? No? I said, thank God in Hinduism we call God is She also. So we worship God as also. The God is worshipped as mother as well, not only as father. He is equal. Elsewhere the people may have problem, father in heaven, and they may not have mother, etc. But then, here Lord Krishna is a Pitamaha Si Jagataha, Mata, Dhata, Pitamaha. I am the father also and mother also and grandfather also and great grandfather and everything I am. So here Purusha does not mean man as such. Purusha means this principle, which is the conscious principle, the self. And Prakriti means the, the Prakriti means that is a medium for the manifestation of Purusha. The Purusha, the consciousness would become incapable of doing something unless Prakriti was there. And Prakriti by herself also would not be capable of doing unless Purusha is there. Just as in an electric bulb, the tungsten filament by itself cannot produce light, nor can electricity by itself produce a light. You require the union of both, the electricity and the tungsten filament for the light to, to be produced. And similarly also, for anything to take place, we require both Urusha and Prakriti. So who is greater? Which one is greater? Urusha is greater or Prakriti is greater? Prakriti can, Purusha can say, you can't do anything without me. Prakriti can say, you can't do anything without me also. <coughs> so Purusha and Prakriti, sometimes translated as spirit and matter. We don't use these words usually, but then you will usually find the translation spirit and matter. Or the conscious principle and the material principle. Prakriti, Purusham Jaiva. So, Etad Vedan Vichyami, Oh Lord, this is what I want to know. What is Prakriti and what she is? It's interesting is, not Purusham Prakritim Chavai in Arjuna's question also, what is place first, you know? Not Purusha. Prakritim Purusham Chaiva. So, I want Prakriti and Purusha, that's what I want to know. That is some kind of satisfaction, you know? So, <laughs> also they always have Sita Rama, you know, in Sanskrit Samasa also, Radha Krishna, Lakshmi Narayana, have you ever noticed this? Always Lakshmi before Narayana, Sita before 
Rama. Radha before Krishna. <coughs> so uh, there's no discrimination here, no? <coughs> Sometimes there's reverse discrimination, really. <laughs> Kshetram, Kshetragnavacha, I also want to know how this question arose in the mind of Arjuna, we'll have to investigate anyway, but somehow this question arose in the mind of Arjuna. He has heard all these terms, I guess, and he wants to see, he's seeking clarification of them. What is the nature of Kshetra and Kshetragnya? So, Kshetragnya, Kshetram Janati, it is Kshetragnya. Kshetra and Gnya, Gnya means a knower. Kshetra and knower of the Kshetra is called Kshetragnya. So, what is what is what is the meaning of Kshetra? And who is, what is Kshetra? What is Kshetragnya? What is Kshetra and knower of Kshetra? That is what I want to know. Jnanam, Gnayam, Jageshava. What is Jnanam? What is knowledge? And Gnayam, Gnayade, that which is known, is called Gnaya. So the, the root that is Gnaya means to know. So Jnanam means knowledge and Gnayam, that which is known. <coughs> so what is Jnanam? What is Gnayam? What is knowledge? What is that which is to be known? So that which is to be known. Etad Vedu Michami, this is what I want to know. <coughs> so as, I, as we said, some editions of Bhagavad Gita include this verse in the beginning of the 13th chapter. It has been included in our text here also. Otherwise, uh, if this verse is not included, then we have to say that the 13th chapter of Bhagavad Gita starts with the discourse of Lord Krishna. There must be some reason why Lord Krishna said what he said then. Then we have to find what motivated Lord Krishna to continue the discourse. Is it not so? Because uh, there are certain chapters of the Gita which open with the question of Arjuna, which is fine. Then there is a reason for Lord Krishna to give discourse. General rule is that you should not give, yeah, you should not say these things or you should not start talking about this unless you are asked about it. So this is a general rule which we said there in Manusmati. <coughs> na prushta kasachit bruyat. A prushta na kasachit bruyat. Unless you are asked, you should not say this to anybody. You should not say anything to anybody, but even particularly this one, you know. Unless they ask you, you should not say this. What happens is, uh, after listening to the class, people are in great enthusiasm and, and they just want to say things. Whoever is the first fellow comes, you know. <laughs> or sometimes you go home and start turning to your spouse. <laughs> That's what happens. And then the response is such that you totally get disappointed or, you know, <laughs> discouraged completely. <laughs> or sometimes it goes against you. you. That's what you said the other day. Now you are doing this, you know. <laughs> and so sometimes it can go against you. So the general rule is that unless asked for, this should not be told. Na prastaha. Somebody asks you all right, but does not ask you properly. He asks, he's, ask, he's not asking you to know something, he's questioning you. See, to ask question is one thing, and to question is another thing. He's questioning you, or he's just making fun of you, or he doesn't really care to know he's asking for the sake of asking. Suppose you find that you were asked, but not asked properly, then also you should not say. But Swamiji, I know, what should I do? Janan napi himedhavi jadavat lokamacharet. So Manusmati says, Janan napi, even though you know, Medhavi, this learned person, even though he knows, jadavat lokamacharet, he should conduct himself as though he doesn't know anything. Somebody asks you, what is Brahman? So, you know. So, sometimes people ask you on the phone and all kinds of things, you know, so, <laughs> different kinds of consultations are there. Well, I'm not saying that you should not answer. If you feel that it is worth answering, that's all right. But general rule is that you do not go about giving these discourses without being asked. These days, of course, the things are different. In the olden days, that would not be there. I told you yesterday, you know, the story of uh, this Prashna Upanishad, where six learned sages, in fact, Rishis, go to sage Pippalada. But Pippalada, no sooner they came, you start, you know, giving discourse on Brahma Vidya, that doesn't happen. 
you just stay here for one year and live the life of austerity, penance, service to the teacher for one year. And then you find, then you ask me the question. If I know, I will tell you. Thank God it was only one year. But in Chandogya Upanishad, the story is that Indra and Virochana, Indra is the king of gods and Virochana is the king of the demons. Not ordinary people, king of gods and king of demons, very powerful people, both of them go to Prajapati, to Brahmaji, seeking knowledge of the self. They stay there for 32 years, not one or two years, 32 years. 32 years living a life of austerity and penance and service to the teacher. After 32 years, the teacher calls him, what, what is the reason why you come here? With what intention have you come? That means that they did not have the audience with the teacher for all those years. But then, very patiently, with all patience and faith and devotion, they continued because prasannam tamanuprapya, only when the teacher becomes pleased with you, that he should ask the question. Say Vivek Chudamani, prasannam tamanuprapya, when the teacher is pleased with you. However he gets pleased. Some teachers get pleased very easily. You just go there and he's pleased with you. Aja, aja. Somewhere it's not that easy, you know. It's not always easy to, to please everybody. So apparently it took them 32 years when they could get the audience of Brahmaji. So what I'm saying is that the tradition has been that it is not that you just start giving the discourses. Only when they ask you and then also when you find that he's a fit student. Tasmai sohova chapitam hascha so a question is asked and then he answered, he replied. The reply means that, yes, he accepted them, accepted this person as a student, found him to be a worthy student and found him to be worthy enough to give, impart this teaching. <coughs> Here in Bhagavad Gita also, you know, Arjuna asked this question. He submitted himself. Yes, Shreyasyat, Nishchitam Bruhi Tanme, as Swami said in the morning, Yad Nishchitam Shreyasyat, Tanme Bruhi, Please tell me that by which I can get Shreyas. Shreyas means the, the good. Nishchitam Shreyaha. I want that goodness which involves no evil at all. I want that gain which involves no loss. So every process of becoming always involves a certain cost. You always have to give up something to go someplace, give up, pay some price in order to achieve anything or, or get anything. Arjuna says, I want to give, give me knowledge of that. Gaining which there is nothing to be gained, or gain which does not involve any loss. So then Lord Krishna started a discourse. <coughs> Otherwise, Lord Krishna knew, is it not? Arjuna wanted to know this. As Swami said in the morning, everybody is a mumoksha. Every, whoever is born is a mumoksha, meaning mok, moksha michu, everybody who is born is desirous of freedom of liberation. Bandha nivartav, that everybody feels a sense of bondage or limitation and everybody wants to become free from bondage. So I'm sure Lord Krishna knew that Arjuna is a mumukshu and that he wants and he needs this knowledge. But still, Lord Krishna did not oblige. See, they were friends, very close friends, almost always together. And still, Lord Krishna did not oblige Arjuna with this knowledge until Arjuna asked. Not only asked, but when Lord Krishna found that he really means what he's asking, as you know, in, 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 in Kathopanishad, even when the question is asked, the teacher does not oblige right away. <coughs> in Kathopanishad, the story is that this boy Nashigeta goes to Yamaraja, the lord, lord of death. And Yamaraja is so pleased with this boy, they offers him three boons. So sometimes we ask children, you know, youngsters, suppose you are offered three boons, you know, what would you ask? <coughs> So, uh, some fellow said, I, uh, first boon I want a Mercedes car, <laughs> second boon I want a swimming pool, third boon I want a house on the beach, something like that, you know. <clears throat> so, Nachiketa also was offered three boons and he asked, you know, in the first boon, please give peace of mind, peace of mind to my father, let my father be happy. Second boon, please give me that by which I can make the whole society happy. So having taken care of all his duties, you know, not the duty like uh, prarabdha, you know, not that kind of duty. So Nasiketa also performed his duties. 
first duty towards his family and the duty towards the society having done that now comes the duty towards his own self and then in the third question he says i want to know the self <coughs> when young boy is asking this such a profound question then the yamaraja lord of death wonders he does he really mean what he says you know sometimes you ask things you heard from some place you know and then you ask question sometimes questioners do not know what they are asking also you know in a question and the session sometimes people ask questions because it is nice to ask it because you heard it some place or read somewhere and therefore they ask you know no exactly what it is they are asking and so yamaraja yamaraja was wondering whether nachiketa means what he says and so and yamaraja did not oblige immediately by giving discourse he tested him he gave lots of all sorts of temptations were offered and when chiketa was firm he was not tempted by anything that was offered to him his vairagya dispassion was very firm and very clear then yamaraja was pleased so teachers get pleased by whatever they are looking for they not may not always get pleased because you present yourself there they may not necessarily get pleased because you when you ask a question everybody has their own criteria of determining whether this is a worthy student or not so in case of nachiketa and yamaraja yamaraja really tested him by making offers have children have have kingdom have sons grandsons have horses elephants gold silver whatever you want he he just was not tempted at all he says all of this is nothing compared to what it is that i want so when yamaraja was now he was certain that he means what he says and he he is value for it then the teaching was imparted all i am saying is that here or not just go ahead <coughs> but that was not the case in the olden days but this is also good you know there are two styles one is the style of a well a well has water but the thirsty person has to go to well pull out the water and then quench the thirst other is the style of a river the river you know travels hundreds of miles and goes to people who need water so there are two styles and i guess we are following the second style you know <laughs> but still as i said that there must be reason why lord krishna in fact continued this discourse in 13th chapter in the verse that we just read if it was not there then there must be some reason why lord krishna in fact continued to start at this 13th discourse and whatever has gone by earlier must be the reason why lord krishna thought it necessary to give this discourse <coughs> in the in the 12th chapter at the end of the 12th chapter eight nine eight beautiful verses in the 12th chapter where uh, lord krishna describes a bhakta yo mat bhakta hai samay priya hai this devotee of mine is very dear to me lord krishna gives certificate you know to the so a devotee such as this one is very dear to me is one thing for me to say that lord is very dear to me is another thing for lord to say that he is very dear to me so of course first stage is that lord becomes dear to me ultimate stage is that i become dear to lord so what is it what makes these people dear to lord what do they have oh they have this great devotion what gives them that devotion adveshta sarbhutana maitra karuna they they hate no one they are friendly to everyone so he does not hate anybody he is friend to everybody he is compassionate to everybody he is free from the sense of this ego and pride and ownership he, he doesn't have any of these things what makes him such he knows something because of which he is what that is what is that knowledge so lord krishna thinks it necessary to impart that knowledge because of which these devotees are what they are so that is how shankaracharya explains how the 13th discourse came about <coughs> but then lord krishna starts the 13th chapter with a very profound statement as i said earlier also that bhagavad gita the 18th chapter of bhagavad gita can be are traditionally thought to be made up of three groups the first six chapters 1 to 6 the second six chapters 7 to 12 the third six chapters 13 to 18 
In the first six chapters, Lord Krishna talks about the self. In the second six chapters, Lord Krishna talks about God. In the third six chapters, Lord Krishna talks about the oneness or identity between self and God. So this is how also the total subject matter of Bhagavad Gita is explained. And so Lord Krishna now thinks that he must reveal or explain the identity between Jiva and Ishvara or Jiva and Brahma. In what way the self is Brahman? In what way I am limitless? As in the morning it was said that if becoming leads only to another becoming. So becoming something becomes only a ground for becoming something else. That getting a new house only becomes a ground for getting new furniture. And getting new furniture becomes only a ground for getting carpets. That becomes a ground for getting the vacuum cleaners. That becomes a ground for getting electricity. So forth and so on. So every everything requires something else. And thus every acquisition becomes a cause for need for a new acquisition. Or every becoming also becomes a cause for a new becoming. And that's how this is why it's called samsara. Samsara the asmanati, samsara. One keeps on sliding and sliding and sliding, like a roller coaster, endless thing. So if this becoming has no end, even if you wind up going to heaven, and then also you become as great as that, and still it has no end, then there must be some other solution. That becoming is not the solution, but that perhaps you are what it is that you want to become. So this is the message of Vedanta, which will be expounded in all these days of course, is that in perhaps this may be possible but Vedanta says you are what it is that you want to become. <coughs> so this is the truth that with that in fact Lord Krishna begins the 13th chapter of Gita revealing the identity between Jiva and Brahma, revealing the fact that the self is in fact Brahman, the limitless, the infinite, the whole or the complete ever free. <coughs> So, Tattva Masi, you are that, you are Brahman, I am Brahman? You know, the next question is, when it is said, you are Brahman, you are limitless, you are whole, you are complete, I am whole, I am complete, I am limitless, how can it be? So, in order to understand then, we must first know what is meant by I. That shows that the whole idea of I has to perhaps, you know, we have to perhaps look into what is the meaning of the word I. I know definitely that I am not God. I know I am not limitless. I am far from that. As it was said in the morning, I am limited in every way. I am limited in time and as much as I was not there before a certain time, I will not be there after a certain time. I know very well. Sometimes thank God that I am in a certain place and not in some other place. That's also good sometimes, you know. Because what happens is we are a number of guests in our place in Ahmedabad, you know. And they left after one week, we had a tremendous earthquake. So they thank God that we were not there. So sometimes it is good also that you are not everywhere. But the idea is that, yes, I can be in one place and not in another place. At one period of time, not other period of time, I possess certain abilities and not other abilities. Then thus I am limited in every way. And this person is told that you are limitless. That means what the Upanishad is saying completely contradicts my own conclusions or my own judgment about my own conclusion about myself or my own notion about myself. I have the notion that I am a limited being in every way. Upanishad says you are limitless. Now that statement has to be understood. And therefore Lord Krishna begins to explain that you are limitless. In what way? What is meant by you? So that must be first clarified. You are not what you take yourself to be. Then what are you? So that is what the first verse tells us here. <coughs> Shri Bhagavan Vacha Shri Bhagavan Vacha Idam Shariram Kaunteya Idam Shariram Kaunteya Kshetra Mitya Vidhiyate Kshetra Mitya Vidhiyate Shetragnya iti tadvidaha Shetragnya 
So who am I? Or when the teacher says, you are limitless, which you is meant? The you that I think I am? Or the you is somewhat different? Or someone different? It is not you or I that I think I am. What is meant by you are Brahman? Or you are limitless? What's the meaning of the word you? That is being explained here in this first verse. Understand Arjuna that you are not what you take yourself to be. <coughs> All this pain that Arjuna had arose because of whatever notion he had about himself. What, what created so much grief in Arjuna? Which would create in anybody, of course, the possibility of death of all these near and dear ones. I mean, who will not be grieved? Anybody will be grieved. I don't know. Sometimes it looks very unreasonable for Lord Krishna to say, Ashod Chanan, Ashod Astham. There is no cause for grief at all. What are you talking, Lord? You mean this is my grandfather and this is my teacher and my cousin and all these people? They are not worth, worthy of being uh, grieved for? So Arjuna says to Lord Krishna at one point, you know, Madhusudana, Arisudana, I mean, you, this seems to your business to slay these demons one by one, you know. Madhusudana, the slayer of demon Madhu, Arisudana, the slayer of the enemies. You seem to be okay, I can't do that. But anyway, so the most important thing here is, even though there is all the reason for grieving, I think that the Arjuna was very aggrieved that he was extremely sorrowful is very understandable. That in our life also that, that we feel very sad, we feel very unhappy, we feel uh, a sense of loss, all of this is very understandable. And so in spite of that Vedanta says that there is no reason for grieving. So Bhagavad Gita in fact addresses a situation of death no less than that. If that can be dealt with, then I think any situation in life can be dealt with. If one can settle account with death, and Arjuna's question was not his own death. I don't think he was so much bothered about his death. He was bothered about death of these near and dear ones. And also further, he was bothered about this, the possibility or this event that he will be their killer. I will be their killer. I, they will be killed by me. This also was a, this also was a significant cause of grief. That they will die, what shall I do without them? And that they will die at my hands. That I will be their killer or a slayer. I will be their slayer. So this is what is the cause of grief. Aham esham mama ete. I am theirs and they are mine. So this is what caused the grief. That's how Shankaraja explains. What is the reason why Arjuna was grieving? Aham esham mama ete. I am theirs and they are mine. If perhaps in the opposite army some other people were there, not, his, not Kauravas, then maybe Arjuna may not have felt that. But here he feels this way because they are all relatives. He is related to them. And he will be their slayer or he will be their killer. So this prospect of his becoming the killer and they being killed by him, this is the cause of grief on the part of Arjuna. <coughs> and of course all this was clarified by Lord Krishna saying that this Nayam Hante The self does not kill, nor is the self killed by anybody. All of this has been explained. <coughs> In fact, understand 13th chapter follows the 12th chapters, and in the second chapter itself, Lord Krishna clarified that you think that you are a killer, or you will be a killer, or you think that they will be killed by you. Nayam hante nahanyate. One who thinks that he is a slayer, other one who thinks that he is slain or he is, he is killed, uvhauta vana vijanita hai, none of them knows. Nayam hante nahanyate because the self neither kills nor is he killed. Katham sa purusha partha kam ghata eti hante kam. So one who knows the self, ajo nitya hai, saswatoyam purana hai, 
So self is ajaha, ajanma, birthless, he is deathless, he is changeless, free from growth, free from decay, free from any changes, free from any modifications, free from kartrutva, bhokrutva, doership, and joaship. All of this has been explained to Arjuna. And in light of that it is said that it is not right or it doesn't, in fact there is no cause of the grief. <coughs> but what was said there is being clarified here in this first verse. How come the self is not the knower, I mean doer? How come self is not the slayer? How come he is not slayed? So, or slain rather, so that is being said here. Idam shariram kaunteya kshetram iti abhidiyate etadyo vittitam prahu kshetragnyaha iti tadvidaha. He kaunteya, he arjuna, idam shariram kshetram iti abhidiyate. This body is called kshetra. Etadyo vettitam prahu kshetragnyaha iti tadvidaha. And one who knows his body is called Kshetragnya. Kshetra and Kshetragnya. So this Lord Krishna says here that in what I call I, in what Arjuna calls Arjuna, or what I may call a Swami, let us say. Who are you? It's a Swami V, you know. So when I uh, Give this kind of identification. That's what I have to say, you know, when you go to airport and things like that and, and ask you different questions, <coughs> your identification, etc. When you ask for identification, what do I tell you? I don't say I'm Satchidananda or something. <laughs> Suppose the airport, when I check in, you know, my luggage, this is your photo ID. <coughs> Thank God it has photo ID, you know. If you ask for identification, suppose you say I'm Brahman or something, that doesn't work there. <laughs> You produce a foot, foot. But then, it is, of course, we have to give the identification with this. He is familiar. But then when I identify myself as so and so, Lord Krishna says that, look, in that, two us, two elements are involved, or two entities are involved. So what we call I is a complex entity made up of two entities. Then we are mixing up things. The idea is that there is basically a mixing up or lumping together in our life. And it is that which is the cause of all the sorrow. I'm sure that will be explained subsequently also by Swamiji. But the idea is that it is this thing. That not knowing myself as to what I am and taking myself to be contrary to what I am is, and the 13th chapter also will discuss this, is the cause of the sorrow, is cause of every problem. <coughs> I mean, that which turns a situation into a problem is this ignorance about my own self which again brings about also and therefore misperception or wrong perception about myself. So Lord Krishna says, hey Arjuna, you have a wrong perception about yourself. You are not what you take yourself to be. When you use the pronoun I, that in that I in fact you include too many things. When you use the pronoun I, you are including too many things. And therefore from that I, from the notion of the I, you should remove what the I is not and retain what the I is. Is it not so? This is a simple thing. So, Arjuna says, I am Arjuna. Lord Krishna says, in you Arjuna, these two entities are there, Kshetra and Kshetragna. So Arjuna in fact is a union of Kshetra and Kshetragna. And you and I, each one of us is the union of these two factors, Kshetra and Kshetragna also called Prakriti and Purusha, as we say, the matter and spirit, the self and non-self. Just as in the example of the electric bulb, we say that when the bulb is glowing, there are these two factors involved, the filament and electricity. So one who does not know, he may think that there is only one thing and that bulb is glowing by itself. The filament does not glow by itself, the filament glows on account of the presence of electricity. And thus electricity and filament, the union of two, brings about what we call light. And similarly also, the union of Kshetra and Kshetragnya brings about life. What we call the life is due to the union of these two, Kshetra and Kshetragnya, or Prakriti and Purusha. As we said just a little while ago, that Purusha by himself cannot do anything, Prakriti by herself cannot do anything. Only when Purusha and Prakriti, both of them unite, that is when 
any creation comes about. That's the reason why Lord Shiva is shown as Ardhanarishwara. That day also the question was asked, I was cross-examined. Swami Dakshina, Lord Dakshina Murthy was a male deity. You know? this, this girl was asking me. I, so I said, uh, thank God, you know, I, I remember something in this Dakshina Murthy. I remember something. That's how I could defend Dakshina Murthy and myself also. <laughs> I said, look, when you go to have Dakshina Darshan of Lord Dakshina Murthy, look closely. Look at the earrings. You find that the left earring is different from the right earring. I, I don't know if you ask me whether I can identify that. I know it for sure. Because when all these things are not there, that is when we had watched, you know, when all the flowers and things are there, you can't perhaps see it clearly. But when they do a Vishaka, etc., in the morning, you can see clearly how the right earring is different from the left earring. And that the right earring is the one that is generally worn by men and the left hearing is the one that is usually worn by women. I'm quite sure the sculptor must have done it right, you know. I mean, I I cannot tell if you give me a ring whether it is a male earring or female earring. <laughs> I'm your hard time to tell you that, you know. But then I'm quite sure the sculptor must have done it right, you know. And so, in fact, both the male and female, both the principles are included here. Then there was peace there, otherwise there would have been a tremendous, you know, <laughs> explosion. Because sometimes people really get excited about this male and female and whatever it is, you know, so whatever. So as I said, if you have to defend, then the one was to defend must have many weapons with them. Attacking doesn't require that many weapons sometimes, but defending requires more weapons, you know. But in short, that's why they said, Lord Shiva is shown as Ardhanarishwara. The left half of the body of Lord Shiva is a female body made of Parvati and the right half is the male body, meaning that there is this union of the two. <coughs> Here in our own personality also, there is union of the two called Purusha and Prakriti or Kshetra and Kshetra. And so Lord Krishna here gives a very simple rule. First of all, tells Arjuna that you first you should know who you are. You are not what you take yourself to be. In your concept of I, he says, too many things are included. And therefore, in the I, the non-I also is lumped together. And therefore, separate the non-I. So in Vedanta, they call it Viveka. Viveka means separation. When two things are mixed up, and so intimately mixed up that you cannot distinguish, otherwise no problem. Sometimes things are mixed up, we know the difference anyway. For example, a rice there may be these black pebbles and so forth, well, you can easily know that. But sometimes the rice, you may have uh, white pebbles, white little pebbles, you know, then it is very difficult to know the difference. I know because as children we were given this exercise sometimes, you know. When we are growing up, this dal picking, you know. <laughs> Why do they call it dal picking? It is pebble picking actually, but anyway. <laughs> here they used to have this you know, dal picking. From the dal, remove the pebbles. From the rice, remove the pebbles. They are always there. As long as those little pebbles are, 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 are black, so you can easily remove. Then you know, uh, the condition used to be that you have to finish this much. Then we, when we ask the mother, Mom, will you please cook such and such dish in the evening? She says, yes, do this thing, you know. The condition. <laughs> so here is the quantity of rice. We call the pebbles from that. Can we have such and such thing? Yes, the, the condition is always there, you know. And so, uh, and you want to finish it off? And then they will take you to task. What did you do? Oh, I removed all the pebbles. See, there is no... Yeah, but then they will find out these white little pebbles in the rice. For which you have to, in fact, sense every grain of rice to distinguish it. Because it is not the eyes by which you can know. It is a sense of touch that you know. The black and white you can separate by eyes. But the hard and soft you can separate only by touch. And so, similarly also, and the things are so mixed up that it's not that easy to distinguish between them, then we have to requ we require a, we require rather subtlety, we require a focus, we require concentration. And that's what Lord Krishna is asking us here, that idam shariram kaunteya kshetram idha viriyate. Here, you know, the sharir or body is called kshetra, 
and the one who knows this Sharira of Kshetra is called Kshetrajna. It's called, this is interesting, you know, this is called Anwarth in Sanskrit. When a name means what it says. And so true to its name, properly so called, or true to one's own name, you know. So it is Sulochana means, Sulochana means a woman having beautiful eyes, you know. So sometimes the names and name and the, the, the what the name stands for, so it is true to the name. Uh, sometimes it is not so. Sometimes the, the, the you know the uh, the person is called Dhanaraj or something like that, you know, and he is a very he is a pauper. And so <laughs> Dhanaraj means one who is a very wealthy person by name, but it doesn't have anything. Sometimes it doesn't work, but here Kshetragnya Anvartam, meaning the name is true to what it stands for. Kshetram Janaditi Kshetragnya. The knower of Kshetra is called Kshetragnya. In short, here Arjuna, understand that within what you call I, there are these two entities, the knower and the known, the subject and the object, the perceiver and the perceived, the illuminator and illumined. These two things have been mixed up here, they have been lumped together, and therefore you have a totally a misperception about your own self, and therefore. Lord Krishna here gives us in this verse the true perception about ourselves <coughs> and then tells us in the next verse what is the nature of that perceiver or the subject. Okay, we'll continue. <coughs> Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachare Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyade Om Shanti 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 Shankaram Shankaracharyam Keshavam Vadarayanam Sutra Bhashya Krutau Vande Bhagavandau Punapunaha Ishvaro Guru Ratnevi Murti Bheda Vibhagine Vyoma Vajyapta Dehaya Dakshina Murtahe Namaha Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Gubhyo Namaha Hari Om